Panic. Hey, um, thank you for stopping by. Uh, my name is Dana Cameron, and we are here to, among other things, celebrate the launch of Pandora's Orphans, which is now up for sale now, a collection of Fangborn short stories. Um, and with me, I have a very talented group of writers who have new books out just recently or forthcoming. And we're here to talk about writing weird and speculative and horrific fiction tonight. So I will introduce them. Uh, John Goodrich is a New Englander by birth and again by choice. Living in the haunted green hills of Vermont, he writes science fiction and horror. He has a passion for many things, including Icelandic sagas, Old English poetry, kaiju, the works of H.P. Lovecraft, and biplanes. Eric Nunnally was born and raised in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, he served one tour in the Marine Corps before deciding that art school would be safer and more a more natural pursuit. He is permanently distracted by art, comics, science fiction, history, and horror. Trained as a graphic designer, he has earned a black belt in Krav Maga and Muay Thai kickboxing after dark. Eventually, Eric came to his senses and moved to Rhode Island with his two lovely children and one beautiful wife. His work includes Blood, the novels Blood for the Sun, Lightning Wears a Red Cape, Lost in Transition, a comic strip uh, collection, uh, uh, and First Prize in a Hamburger Contest. It does not have All the Dead Men, which is the second in the Alexander Smith novels. His stories appear have appeared in Lamplight, the podcast Nightlight, The Final Summons, Wicked Witches, Transcendent, and Protectors 2. Paul uh, McNamee's short stories have appeared in multiple anthologies and magazines. His debut novel, A, P a, Pulp, Hero Super uh, a Pulp Superhero Tale, uh, Hour of the o Robot, was released just recently in July under the Mystique Press imprint of Crossroad Press. And finally, Zinn E. Rockland is a contributor to the Bram Stoker nominated and This Is Horror award-winning Nox Paradolia, Kaiju Rising 2, Reign of the Monsters, Brigands, A Blaggard's anthology, and Forever Vacancy anthologies, and Weird Luck Tales. Their story, Summer's Skin, in the Bram Stoker nominated anthology, Sycorax's Daughters, received an honorable mention for Ellen Datlow's Best Horror of the Year. Uh, Zinn contributed to the nonfiction, uh, contributed the nonfiction essay, My Genre Makes a Monster of Me, to Uncanny Magazine's Hugo Award-winning Disabled People Destroy Science Fiction. And the short story, The Night Sun, was published as, at Tor.com. Zinn is a 2017 Vona and 2018 Viable Paradise graduate, as well as a 2021 Clarion West candidate. Her novella, Flowers for the Sea, is described as a dark, dazzling debut novella that reads like Rosemary's Baby by way of Oct Octavia Butler and goes on sale October 19th. And I'm Dana Cameron. Um, I write noir, historical fiction, urban fantasy, thriller, and traditional mystery, almost all of which is drawing uh, on my background in archaeology. I've won um, multiple Agatha Anthony McCavity Awards and earned uh, an Edgar Award nomination. And most recently, my Emma Fielding Archaeology Mysteries have been optioned and have been appearing, in fact, on um, the Hallmark Movies and Mysteries channel. So uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you all for stopping by. Uh, let's see. What shall we start with? Let's start with something obvious. What draws you to writing weird fiction? Just jump in. I would like this to be a conversation, if possible. <laughs> Virtually well, I, impossible. Impossible. <laughs> well, I just have to say that I'm a weird person, and so I'm just expressing myself in a weird fashion. Can confirm. Weirdly stated. <laughs> <laughs> Zin, how about you? Yeah, that's pretty much. <laughs> that's pretty accurate. I'm a weird person. I gotta express myself and. And weird fiction has always been more of, I think, a better vehicle for the weird shit that's in my head. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, Paul? Um, I don't know. Probably just, I mean, I like to think I'm not that weird, but I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I, I come from, you know, liking you know Robert E. Howard and Conan and, um, you know, when I first found the H.P. Lovecraft stuff, because a lot of it was set in Massachusetts, even though it was fictional, it was sort of like, ooh, um, you know, Stephen King in Maine, we have Lovecraft doing stuff in Massachusetts. And um, mm -hmm. so uh, just kind of, um, you know, like it, read it. And that's also kind of what I started writing. Very cool. Eric? Yeah, I, I think I'm perfectly normal and well-adjusted. And um, <laughs> I, I, 
Oddly enough, my, my I, I never really enjoyed much Lovecraft, um, and I don't think I've written a lot of weird fiction, but um, I was really introduced to it, I think, actually, by John Goodrich there, mm-hmm. um, and Larry Barron. Um, and the thing about the weird fiction that I'd read from them w- was that it's um, it was kind of a spice on top of something else more familiar. Mm-hmm. either a crime story or thriller or something like that. And, and I found that it, it really added some really interesting dimensions to it, like uh, to, you know, genres that we're used to reading. So, or more popularly read. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I started adding more elements of that stuff um, when when I started writing more. Very cool. Yeah, I, I find that uh, I sort of, sort of was, was, I won't say it's a slippery slope, but it would seem like the next logical step is that um, writing uh, uh, urban fantasy with werewolves and starting to think of how that could be reimagined. And then uh, finding that the few horror stories I've written, I've really enjoyed because they give me a way of talking about things uh, that might be happening in the real world that, um, and it gives me a way of responding to them in a way that's, uh, creative and also a bit uh, violent. So uh, that's part of what I, it gives me, it gives me that outlet. It's a bizarre, it's a bizarre unnerving lens to look at things through. And I, I think one of the, one of the most compelling things about it is it's, it's, you really can't be too sure of what, um, that things will be settled yeah. when the story's over. And I, that's what's I think most interesting about weird fiction in particular. Yeah, I feel it feels most like life in that respect. Everything's not necessarily wrapped up. It's only like it's a punctuation mark. It doesn't necessarily mean the end. You know, an ellipsis or, a, or oddly a, enough, yeah, most like life. Yeah, it, and you know, well, John's the one who started off saying that he was weird. So I think, yeah, most like life. Yeah. Um, I would like you all to read a bit of a of a of a part of your selection tonight. Um, uh, Paul, would you like to start? Read maybe read something from Our the Robot. Okay, I'll just read the little um, the teaser blur with the front. Cool. A bit of action. The understudy's second target had dropped to his knee, waiting to trip her. She has spied the hunch shape and kept running toward him, leaping over him at the last minute. She spun and landed a roundhouse kick against his chest as he stood up. This brawler was tougher than her last takedown. He kept his feet firmly planted. He didn't defect the, deflect the blow. He absorbed it. He punched a meaty fist at her, but she spun into the smoke and disappeared from his view. She sidestepped, and the man predictably moved in a straight line after her. She went for another kick, but halted. Her mission wasn't to take everyone down. She needed to gather evidence. She padded away deeper into the smoke. The smoke dispersed into wisps as the understudy reached the edge of the smoke screen near the pier and the boats. Two of the boats had already accelerated away out of range. The remaining had trouble. The motor raced. Either something was amiss, or the pilot had flooded the engine in a panic. She raced toward the boat and stopped halfway from the deck of the boat, multiple gun barrels pointed in her direction. Ooh, lots of action there. Um, Paul, this, I mean, clearly the, the, there's DNA from the pulp traditions that you were describing earlier in your, in your work and in, in the short stories I've read by you and as well as our The Robot. What is it that speaks to strong, so strongly to you from that? Um, that uh, I think it's the, a lot of it's just the pacing. There's a lot of action. Um, well, I mean, if you're doing like pulp action stories, obviously pulp did westerns, they did mysteries, they did um, horror, um, and some of the atmosphere building, um, some of the you know off the cuff world building. Um, again, it's it's sort of what I liked to read, and um, it just sort of comes out. And of course, this has a big, this has superheroes in it. It's it's pulpy, but it's also you know, um, frankly, it's, it's straight out of like Justice League for me. Um, so some comics there, which I came to late in life, by the way, not like some people I know have been reading them all their lives. Um, so just sort of a mixed ball of all that. Um, you know, we can talk later about writing and pulp and stuff. I, mean, I actually think nowadays I prefer the, what, what's called the new pulp. Mm-hmm. Because, um, it's new. Yeah, you know, I can talk to the authors because they're alive. Um, and, you know, uh, they jettison the junk you know, the, obviously the racism, the sexism, they said they jettison that, they keep the good stuff and they move forward. Very so. cool. Yeah, it was, it was, it was fun to read about the understudy and I, I wondered whether at the end you sort of hint that there might be a sequel. Oh, I sure hope so. Okay, cool. Yeah. 
I actually have a really big idea, but I almost feel like it's almost too big. It might be the close of like a trilogy, and I need to do something in the middle first. Uh, middles are tough. <laughs> Um, just as a general writing question, do you write best when you feel most secure, when you're most pissed off, when you're most scared? Is that when things start to flow for everyone? Or, or when is it that you feel like you are the most productive as a writer? Anyone? Uh, you know what? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ignore that question. Oh, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump all over your comments about the middle being difficult. And ah, oh, gonna, please. What it made me think of is is that uh, authors of a certain age, and I don't I don't think we're all of that certain age, but if if your formative years were spent uh, with Star Wars, mm -hmm. then like your like the the initial understanding of of uh, an exciting story started in the middle. Um, Indiana Jones is the same way, like it's something that's, you know, it starts in the middle of his life. Um, and I, I kind of did the same thing with, with um, Blood for the Sun and All the Dead Men. It's, it's, it kind of starts in the middle and it leaves the opportunity to write all that backstory that you've created and, and also to do more stuff in the future. And that's what I like about the, uh, the, the middle type story. And I, I, I really think that everyone, Every writer I know who's around my age tends to do this. And I, I really think it's actually all sourced from Star Wars. It was all the middle. Interesting. Um, does, it, does anyone else feel that way? Because I find when I get to the middle, I know I have to be doing certain things. So there's a lot of work for me to sort of tie the beginning and the ending together because I don't write in order. So how do you feel about the middles of books, the middles of series? <clears throat> I've been, uh, I, I realized that my process is like Robert Bloch's. I have a beginning and I have a punchline at the end. And then I sort of have to connect that by, by non straight lines. So middles are what I work the most at. Mm -hmm. um, but you'd say that you, when you, when you write something uh, in the, 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 you're not a sequel guy, right? I, I don't think I've ever seen you do multiple books in, in a, with a particular character or anything or you would be wrong sir ah. it's just i'm too precious about it to uh to give it to just any <laughs> publisher quite yet <laughs> if you'd like to know if you'd like to know any screw up you can do in publishing i've done it <laughs> then how about you uh i think i'm pretty similar to john in that um i have a beginning and then I can usually grasp at an end. Mm -hmm. um, so the middle is what interests me most. Um, and usually is what gets me stuck, but <laughs> but yeah, I, I enjoy middles. I don't mind middles. Cool, cool. Have you done any sequel stuff? I don't have any sequel stuff actually, out, nothing yeah. out. Uh -huh. But you've thought of some things then. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. Nice. Nice. Uh, Zin, would you um, read a bit from Flowers for the Sea for us? Sure. I'll read the intro. Cool. Okay. The children imitate razor fangs. I am without an yet another night's rest. The swell of my belly increases with each new dawn. My joints all filled with useless, li with useless fluid, hindering movement and completion of daily tasks. I abhor my present state, but termination is not an option. As I've been told to the point of biliousness, this child must be born. 1743 days at sea. Recollections of a life without the current in our legs is a stuff of fables and fairy tales. We trade stories. The babes listen in wonder, having taken their first steps on this cursed boat, their disbelief palpable. Teens brood in mildewed corners, hissing at the daylight and orders to earn their keep. They bleed late, and we are eternally thankful to the godless depths below. We rut in anger and loneliness, every, and every once in a while, an affliction is cast upon we will birthing folk. I'm the only to carry this far. And I'll stop there. Oh, it's that's a good place to stop. That's just like, ooh, I want to find out more of that. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's the crux of the, uh, the novel, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to reading that. One of the things I regret over this past and here we are online is is um at conventions and such being able to you know buy buy books from authors instead of 
getting them and trying to remember to bring them with me and get yeah. them signed and stuff. But yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to reading that. It, it reminds me of um, uh, just what you read reminds me of a story I read about uh, it was uh, there was a civil war and displacement of people. And there was a woman who mm. maintained her pregnancy well beyond what we understand to be the nine to 10 months. Mm. Just, you know, it was almost, I hate to say magical, but you know, the, the way her body responded to that stress was to retain the baby. And she did not give birth until like 13 or 14 months later. Wow. Wild. Uh, yes. No, but I, um, I was lucky enough to see a, a copy of it and I can't wait for everyone to read it because it's an amazing book. The ending knocked my socks off in the best possible way. Oh, awesome. So, so October 19th? October 19th, yep. Excellent. Um, let me just follow up uh, with you, Zen. Um, your short stories, especially Summer Skin, which unnerved me in all the best ways possible, <laughs> um, and your forthcoming Flowers for the Seat, focus on body horror and narrators who are, are sympathetic and yet to outsiders monstrous, or might appear to be monstrous. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about um, maintaining that balance? Um. It's more of a knack because I kind of, I guess it's something that I balance within my own life um, because of, you know, how media portrays Black women, how uh, literature portrays us and what is expected of us in the publishing industry and things of that sort. So it's definitely something that I've had to reckon with since I was a child. Um, so uh, balancing that has come has become second nature um because my tears don't mean the same as a white woman's and that's something that was one of the harder lessons to learn growing up um and yeah that's something that i just I, i'm glad that it reflects in my in my fiction so that's something that i strive for in my fiction yeah, and I, you know, but particularly, uh, I was thinking uh, summer skin because you're going along with the narrator, and you're thinking, oh, this this poor person, and you know, they seem like they're they're yearning for something, and they are, and then you start to realize that it's not quite exactly what you think is going on, um, that they haven't actually found uh, a, a relative, shall we say, but um, and and yet it's still like. If I'm rooting for for them, is that what does that say about 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 the reader? Let's say, you know? yes. <laughs> yes. I want you to be conflicted. Yes, <laughs> yes. Bucket full of conflict. Absolutely. Um, uh, since we're since we're just just briefly like since we're on the subject of Zin short stories, when when Dana read the intro for you, did did I hear correctly? You have a short story in a uh, a, a kaiju anthology. Yeah. Yes, I do. It's called. You've written a monster story like that. Yeah, when a kaiju falls in love. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't know whether you know that, but um, John Goodrich has a fez for having watched the most uh, kaiju movies in one lifetime, I think, or one year. John, yeah. John, how many was it that you watched? Uh, it was ninety-three. Ooh. That's now up to one hundred and twenty-seven. Wow. <laughs> Wow. Maybe you need to trade you know, trade lists at some point or something. Yeah, you just put that information to good use. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yes, I am. Um let's see. Uh you know, Eric, you quite quite neatly, a little jujitsu there, sidelined my question about how people write their best or how they feel um like they are when, when is it that you're um able to produce the most? Is it when you're really, if you feel really secure and safe, it's because you're really pissed off. If you're really scared about something and that's the way of putting it into controls with the story. Yeah, I think it, for me, it's it's really secure and safe. And I, I noticed that this, <laughs> this happened when I took on the additional responsibility of other people in my life. Mm -hmm. um, so like, I'm, I'm already sort of mildly paranoid. It, it, I, I realized recently that it's it's been driving a lot of my decisions and I need to kind of spin that down. Mm -hmm. um, but but having you know my two daughters and my wife and you know keeping the roof over the head and making sure that we eat and uh, you know keeping the lights on and stuff like that is becomes so much more unnerving and I can't operate 
creative creatively when there's anything unsecure like that. So yeah, when it's when everything's copacetic and quiet, then mm -hmm. yeah, I can I can do this stuff. <laughs> yep. Paul, how about you? Um, yeah, I think the security. I I can tell you, I you know I've written a lot of loud, angry rock songs when I'm mad, when I was mad and young, um, <laughs> but the. Um, uh, people look at me and like he's a rock and roll animal. I didn't know that. Um, but, uh, <laughs> That's how you the, read. That's how you present, man. Rock and roll animal. Yeah, but the, like um, long here, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> um, but my writing, I mean, I really, I, I don't go for high literary aspirations. I just, I, I'm, I'm sort of someone who just wants to entertain, entertain myself. So I, I think, yeah, the security is a better place where I write from. Um, if I have a really good idea, I'll just sort of run with the idea. Um, I mean, Hour of the Robot, you know, it's not my first, it's my first published novel. Mm -hmm. I do have a couple I trunked. Um, but just the, the, the core idea of, you know, it really, it's one of those stories that was absolutely organic. It was the, uh, what would the robot do if the, if the superhero was, you know, incapacitated? I don't want to give away too much. Um, mm -hmm. And it all just sort of sprung out of that. So just sort of following with that story. Some just sometimes the energy is just following the story. Very cool. Hey, John. Yes. Um, uh, it depends. I mean, if 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 I'm if I'm generating ideas, being angry actually uh, works better for me. But if I'm doing the actual the the hard part, the working, uh, then I need to be safe, secure in a mellow place, not having been yelled at by customers, you know, uh, and I'm in a position where that doesn't happen much anymore. So um, I, I feel like I'm getting uh, much more writing done. Very cool. Is it? Um, I have I, similar to John again, where it's I, when I'm generating ideas, I'm usually very uncomfortable mm -hmm. uh, in some kind of way. But in order to get through usually the middle, <laughs> I have to be in a like a calmer state. Um, my surroundings have to be calmer and things like that. So yeah, yeah, it's the same for me. I realized that um, I can write the most horrible stuff to me, the things that scare me most when I am pretty sure that's not what's going to be knocking at the door mm -hmm. next. You know what I mean? So um, let's see. Uh, John, would you read something from Little Bridges? Oh, sure. Please. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Before she could decide what to do, a gun muzzle was pressed against her head. No, please, she whispered. Please don't. There are so many things she wanted to do. None of them involved having her brains splattered across the floor. The gun moved. She could breathe again. The fear came flooding out of her in a gasp. She dared to look. The first thing she saw was the huge metal mass of the gun. Fear surged and she fought it down. Beyond the gun was a tiny face. A toddler's face. A little white boy, each hand gripping impossibly a massive automatic pistol. Are you going to tell anyone? He asked. His tiny pink tongue snaked out and he licked the slider of the pistol. Was she dead? Had she gone insane? She didn't dare scream even though her head was going to explode if she tried to keep it in. It took all of her willpower just to nod. <laughs> so good. Right? It's, um, I've, I've read a lot of your, your fiction, uh, John, like, and you've written a lot of different types of, of horror or weird or, um, or fantasy, but Little Britches, I mean, a toddler with a hand cannon and a diaper full of armaments. You gotta tell me about where that came from um, and why, what was it that you wanted to explore with this character? Um, well, this came from two things. One, it came from a 2015 newspaper article that said essentially um, a toddler kills an American, shoots an American once a week uh, shoots shoots someone dead once a week in america mm -hmm. and most people will go well that's a tragedy and my brain goes that is one hell of a toddler <laughs> <laughs> which is why i'm different from most people <laughs> it's put him to work <laughs> <laughs> that's 
right. So, and with with that, you know, sort of with that, uh, and um, uh, uh, work of um, cultural anthropology because I'm a huge nerd uh, called Gunfighter Nation, which um, mm -hmm. Professor Slotkin talks about uh, America's relationship with the gun. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of wanted to explore that in a very sideways fashion. Uh, so I came up with this character and I'm like, okay, so what does he do? Uh, and honestly, it just sort of rained out of the sky. I mean, of, of course, he would try to go up against the mafia. Yeah. <laughs> we all have aspirations and dreams that we're going for. And this is America, as you say. That's right. <laughs> and if you can, if you can shoot people, who's going to hire you? Yeah, the, the uniforms probably wouldn't fit them in the military. Mm. And, uh, but, um, you know, yeah, height, that, I, I, height requirements a problem. Yeah. Not, not backpacks also going to be an issue for the little guy. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is, is not a hole. This is not a rabbit hole we want to go down. <laughs> and, and this is the thing. This gave me permission to just go down that rabbit hole. Yeah. And someone has asked me, have you considered a sequel? And one image <laughs> showed up in my head. Little britches driving down the Las, the, uh, the Las Vegas Strip in a big wheel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll work. Because but, but, but the funny thing is, I'm I'm fifty percent in, and it's you know, your your your, your first your first act is like I. <laughs> the only the only curveball is little britches. Otherwise, it's reading like a, a, a hard hard case crime book. Uh, but your 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 assassin's this little maniacal toddler. So it is a perfect little bizarro. You know, it's a mix of two things, right? It's it's yeah. it's really it's it's different from anything I've seen, and it's it's uh, it's a it's a hoot. Uh, okay, everyone. Um, in a world where we are swamped with images of the horrific or weird or what might be called that by some people, pizza rats, murder hornets, sinkholes, the Pentagon's releasing images of unidentified aerial objects, um, does that make it harder or easier for you to write speculative fiction? Because it seems like we're almost intersecting with a kind of, uh, with the weird world as it were. Yeah. I, I think it's easier. Um, there's. I know this fiction out there that doesn't do this, but um, but it, I, I think you know Paul mentioned earlier it's 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 really uh, creating this stuff for me anyway is really an escape from mm -hmm. that. Okay, because that that's unsettling because it's it's real, and you know certainly you can draw inspiration from those things and put them in your story. Um, make them even crazier as, as John is doing or, <laughs> or uh, make them more subtle somewhere in the background. But um, I, I think there's some comfort in being able to hold a story um, to take yourself away from, from where you are, uh, really enjoy it. Um, and it just, it's, it's a real distraction and, and nine times out of 10, it's, it's going to resolve in a way that's either got you thinking about how, uh, how it ended or um, upset about how it ended um, or, or wanting more. Um, none of which are, are things that happen with, with reality, really. Nobody really wants, you know, more earthquakes or more fires or, you know, murder hornets and pizza rats and things like that. But you can take those things and have a little fun with them. And it, it defangs everything, I think. Yeah, I, I now I'm seeing a, a you know pizza rat and and little britches team up, <laughs> and um, anyway, um, anyway, sorry, John, you've ruined all of us. Damn it! Um, Mission accomplished. Yay! <laughs> Zin, how about you? Does that um, make an impact on how you write? Not really. Um, I think in a lot of ways, it's a it's a great break from what I write. Mm -hmm. um, it's a nice little palate cleanser. But for the most part, it doesn't really affect how I write because you could still show the truth to people and they still wouldn't believe it. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> as we've been shown here. Yeah. So. Oh gosh, mm. for sure. Yeah, that's the thing. I find that most of the time it's, I'm not necessarily gonna write about a pizza rat. I might write about a sinkhole that sort of speaks to me, you know, speaking as, you know, a recovering archeologist, but um, if it's one of those things that I'm like, I'll, I'll get so sputtering angry that people aren't hearing the truth or aren't buying the truth. And then that sort of gives me a way in. It's like this, it's the spark of emotion from those things, perhaps not necessarily the things themselves, the reaction to it is what feels me. Paul. Um, yeah, well, like Eric said, I'm more of an escapist writer. So, um, and I mean, there's always, you know, every, every generation I'm sure has its horrors or what they think are their horrors. Um, you know, there's been pandemics before. There just wasn't our pandemic. Um, so, uh, yeah, and um, again, I'm not someone at this point anyway who, who does the bleed on the page thing, so I'm not going to take that. It terrifies me and write it out. I, 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 don't, I don't go down that path, at least not currently. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I like, I'm sort of a traditionalist. I like Cthulhu mythos. I like ghost stories. Um, you know, in fact, the two novels I trunked were my attempts at modern horror, and I'm, frankly, I just don't know that I'm that great at it. So, so, you know, I'll find, I'll find, find what I am good at. Uh, so that's, that's part of it is, yeah. the, you know, um, when I was talking to Tony Keller and Charlene Harris a couple of weeks ago, um, I think uh, Tony was talking about really, really wanting to be a science fiction writer. And yep. she wrote, she was not happy with her science fiction. She's like, it was really dumb. But then she started thinking about mysteries and how she'd always been to them. So sometimes you get to write and like go, okay, that, that is really not going to work and find something else to do. Yeah, for a friend of mine, Scott Oden, writes historicals, although he's he's recently done some sword and sorcery, but he had a really good essay early on on his blog, which I think he dropped. It was his whole thing about how you, you know, he'd written his Conan novel and did this, and somebody said, it's okay. Mm -hmm. And then he realized that, you know, he might not be cut out for it, and he found his niche in histor historicals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Eric, have you you haven't had a chance to read first yet? Would you read first? Sure, please. Um, I'll I'll read a little bit from uh, a short story I have in uh, Giving the Devil His Due, which mm. is an anthology that's been put together by the Pixel Project to, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm really shortening this, but to basically they're they're trying to reduce eliminate uh, violence against women, mm. um, and the the call for this. <laughs> was was really uh, do what you want to 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 make someone pay for their um, their abusive ways mm -hmm. um, and it was supposed to have like a real Twilight Zone esque feel and I, I think I leaned a little more into uh, sort of just writing straight fiction um, anyway um, it's a scene so the setup is essentially that this couple has just dropped their kid off at college and it's a little tense and you get a taste of how uh what kind of a jerk the uh the father is um and he's been a bit of an ass on the on the airplane on the way home um and the wife is is in a very contained position um but things are new because now the son's not part of the dynamic and this is called the devil's hollow this is called uh, Devil's Hollow. That's correct. They drove home with Mike leaning hard on the gas and cursing other drivers. Before the garage door could close all the way, Mike yanked the bags out of the trunk and dropped them in the foyer. He stalked into the dining room and pulled out a bottle of bourbon. They'd had dinner before the flight, but Carla knew her husband well and went into the kitchen. She pulled out the fixings for a sandwich. Mike swallowed a mouthful of whiskey and said, what are you doing? In the midst of washing her hands, she replied, you're headed back to work tomorrow, and, and it'll be early. We had such an early dinner, I, I thought some food now would help you sleep well and get a fresh start. That's what you thought, huh, that I looked hungry? Mike leaned back, a thoughtful look on his face. Carla didn't answer, and he didn't, answer, he didn't ask again. She focused on the task at hand. By the time she brought the sandwich over to the table and set it in front of him, he looked melancholy. Davy's gone, he said. She nodded, refusing the bait to disagree with his statement. Instead, she gave a tight smile and said, our little boy's off to college. That he is. Mike eyed the sandwich and took another drink of whiskey. But he ain't little anymore. Right. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to unpack and shower at the airports, you know. She shivered a bit. Yeah. 
Carla walked to the kitchen and froze when he called her name. Mike said, I love him, you know, I, I do. Then you should have told him once in a while, Carla thought. I know, she said over her shoulder. Thanks for the sandwich, she said to her back. She heard him take a bite. You're welcome, she answered and walked into the foyer. Upstairs, Carla unpacked, disrobed, and ran a hot shower. Afterwards, she toweled off, moisturized, and pulled a large tube of aloe vera from the cabinet beneath the sink. She ran the hot water while applying balm to the bruise on her tricep. When the water steamed, she filled a small rubber bottle and placed it against the five purple marks for several minutes. She looked down at her body and her flat stomach, strong cheekbones, even features, wavy hair, a short cut that framed and accentuated her deep brown eyes. She put the effort in. She worked out more often than she didn't. Mike insisted. He liked it that way. Like the bruise on her arm, Mike left an imprint on whatever he thought was his. Carla took a ragged breath, forcing her thoughts to stop unreeling. She put everything away. Before leaving the bathroom, she peeked into the bedroom to see if Mike had come upstairs while she was in the shower. The bed was empty. She turned on the light on Mike's side of the bed, turned hers off, and crawled under the covers, listening. After 10 minutes, she could hear her husband's heavy steps on the stairs. She curled up, tense, struggling to keep her breathing even. The noise of blood rushing in her ears couldn't drown out Mike's puttering before bed. The dresser drawers open and closed, his wallet clacked on top. The clatter of his watch on the nightstand, shoes thumping on the floor, the light metallic jangle of his belt. The bed creaked and shook as Mike sat on the edge. She could smell a cloud of alcohol around him, like a light fog or the rush of energy preceding a storm. His breathing heaved. He sighed, and the sound of skin on skin raked her nerves as Mike rubbed his face. She held her breath as he pulled the covers back, flopped over and snuggled up behind her. He ran one of his thick hands through her hair and down her side. She didn't react, maintaining deep, regular breaths. He dropped his heavy arm over her, settling into the pillows. Blasts of hot, whiskey-tinged air tickled the back of her head. It seemed as if Mike's breathing triggered the flash of a terrible idea in her mind. She buried it, more concerned with the present. Carla didn't fall asleep until Mike's snores rumbled through the air, and she'd managed to put down the wicked thought. And that's the scene. Very cool. Wow. wow. I, I, you know, I, I actually intended to mention that it's uh, this cool. type of story could be very triggering for somebody who's suffered any kind of abuse because there's a lot of threatening patterns in Mike's behavior and, mm -hmm. and the things that he does. But it's all about comeuppance. So. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's in the it's um it's written so that you start to get those warning signals that the way that you know that any um if if there's danger in the air, you start to realize that something's coming down the pike and Mike is gonna explode one way or the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it was probably it's one of the harder things I've had to write because so much of it is reality based and it needed to have certain supernatural elements, but yeah. We get there. You do. You do. It's um, and that's in um, giving the devil his uh, his due, which comes out in September. Is it from um, Running Wild Press? Um, I also have a story on that. Uh, in, uh, it uh, for some reason it takes class uh, class uh, takes place in academia, um, and so <laughs> where I've had some uh, ex experience with um, people who need to get what's coming to them. And I had a good time writing that. It was hard. It was hard to write because I was digging up a lot of stuff, but um, I was very happy with the way it ended up. And that brings me to, um, oh, I wanted to ask you um, about Alexander Smith. In the Alexander Smith books, he's a werewolf and he's fighting the loss of his memory. So you describe it as a kind of uh, Alzheimer's. Um, and, and by doing that, in order to fight it, he needs to hang on to his humanity. And it seems to me that there is a recurring theme of, of um, memory and monstrousness, or keeping monstrousness at bay with memory, is that? Am I reading too much into that, or is that uh, something that? So it's a for for what I was writing, it's a conflation of of things. Um, my both of my grandfather, I should say. So I'm I'm 53, and my so that puts my parents and my grandparents <laughs> well before like the civil rights era. Mm -hmm. And um, at least in, in my universe, a lot of men drank and they weren't they weren't the caretakers in the home. My mm -hmm. grandmothers were. 
and you know my grandmothers and my mother and my aunts and such and my both of my grandfather uh, grandmothers suffered from um dementia alzheimer's like these memory robbing uh, mm. diseases as they aged and you know i got to witness a lot of that stuff firsthand when i was very young and then you know eventually it inspired this idea of uh what it's what it's like to lose your memories but it's you know it's it's a hot mix with um with the supernatural and and in i mentioned earlier defanging something like this isn't in reality these diseases robbing your memories uh long term short term they they turn people like a light switch into another person it's very disturbing um it's kind of horrifying to watch and it's it's deeply sad uh but i can take that in this story and actually give it a reason like there's a reason for the for his memories spiraling away it's like there's a, a reason that there are monstrous aspects in this character's life and um i just like i really like the idea not only of, of chasing that down in in like a detective style story because he's mm-hmm. trying to unravel a conspiracy but um actually they're actually being uh, uh, at least an identifiable reason for it whether there's a solution or not um but yeah this stuff it turns people into monsters it really does you unrecognizable yeah and they don't recognize you i mean it it, it goes yeah both ways. yeah it's it's like the uh, it's a trigger for hostility hmm. and hostility like that coming from someone you no, or even someone you don't know. You, you know, I, I have a scene in the book with a, a, a waitress, waitstaff, that um, just saw him five minutes ago, and he completely forgets the interaction, and it becomes a hostile interaction, yeah. um, which is totally unfair to that person. They, they don't even know. They don't even know each other. But you know, getting that wash of anger is, I think, I find to be disturbing. Mm-hmm. Um, I was. We spoke a little bit about <clears throat> your influences and everything, and I, I think there's a lot of overlapping uh, in our little Venn diagram of where we, we draw our influences, writers, uh, in terms of uh, noir, clearly, um, horror, monster movies. Um, I know that I'm drawing a lot from uh, from history and, and, and cultural studies. Could you, uh, we talk a little bit more in depth about that sort of thing? Um, John, you were talking about earlier about um, <clears throat> kaiju, Lovecraft, and Icelandic uh, <laughs> sagas. So, I mean, are they always at the for, uh, at the forefront for you, or uh, what? What? What, in, um, what influences you? Well, I, I started off doing uh, Lovecraftian pastiche, uh, and and have sort of branched out. Um, my first novel was a haunted house novel. Uh, my second novel was extreme horror. Uh, this one is is uh, bizarro or weird fiction. Um, so it's whatever whatever I take in comes out in a in a very different form. Like I I, ta- I try to take the 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 wonderful understatement of Icelandic sagas and and use that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, H H P Lovecraft had a lot of really unpleasant aspects to himself and to his fiction so i try to to remove that and sort of concentrate on like the what made his um what made his what made his prose good um so i a lot of the time i when i when i re reread what i've done um i i can't figure out where that came from but uh that was kind of cool so you know i'm, I'm leaving it alone <laughs> paul you talked about um about the reasons that you love pulp is there is there one pulp uh tradition or uh or genre you know western noir that particularly speaks to you um for quite a while i, was, I very much enjoyed sword and sorcery um mm-hmm. And uh, but I've sort of moved through like genres now. Now I kind of when the pulp stuff, I just I, I enjoy the action stuff. Um, and uh, there's a great um, Airship Twenty Seven has revived Bulldog Drummond, 
and they have mm -hmm. a British writer, and they are they are well done. I mean, I, I'm waiting for volume three, and it's just it's just fun action. He's up, you know, he's up day again. He's he's jettisoned the 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 ugly parts, and mm -hmm. uh, just you know done a done a really great job. Um, yeah, it's kind of like John with my writing. Again, I go back to music cause for quite a while. I was I did music before I wrote, and uh, I could not. I can look at a song I wrote, and I could almost tell you like where those riffs came from or, or what what i was aiming for or where where you know that's 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 like some pete townsend would do and then i put this on it and mm -hmm. you know a friend of mine would be like oh that's a McNamee song you know he could just tell um but i just i haven't been writing long enough to be able to look at my writing and say that mm -hmm. um, often i'm surprised people will come back and they'll, they'll read a short story of mine and they'll say oh that was blank meets blank and i was like Oh, I guess that probably could have been happening unconsciously, <laughs> subconsciously, <laughs> but um, but I I don't see it far as for the trees right now, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Zin, you um, I I know in different interviews you talked about your uh, Trinidadian uh, heritage, and uh, your brother trying to scare you with monster movies, and how how do those shape uh, your work? Well, definitely a lot of Trinidadian folklore is about keeping a kid in line um, so and and making sure that you're home before dark and things like that and um and i also always got a thrill from them so it, it had it had the right effect but it also had like this weird fascination with me um so that's definitely something where if i feel that thrill while i'm writing that's when i'm like okay i'm hitting it i'm getting what my parents told me about like Dwen and and which is uh, unbaptized children who died, um, and their feet are turned backwards. When you see them, their feet are turned backwards, and they wear these very large sun hats to hide their teeth. Ooh. So <laughs> yeah, so these are the things that we were told about as kids oh. to like to keep us in line. Um, so um yeah i and you know also my brother doing his part you know haunting me and the only one the only thing that really scared me to the point of like this is bad was Candyman. Ooh, and that was because tony todd looks like my uncle <laughs> so it really hit home that not only is this a black man who is who has become this legend, who has become an urban legend, who has become um, this this malevolent spirit. He looks like my family, so he can totally be an actual thing. And I like when I told you I avoided mirrors, like, <laughs> like I would run out the bathroom. Like it was bad. It was really bad. But. Um, yeah, so those definitely introduce me, it, like influence me rather, um, when I'm writing. It's um, so when you when you start to feel that little thing at the back of your, you know, at the back of your head, and, and it and it feels like the sort of things that your parents were trying to. to yep, to exactly. You. Yeah, then you know exactly. it's like okay, I've got it. <laughs> I got it. I got it. Yep. Uh, Eric, uh, you and I, and I'm sure most. Um, most, if not all of us, love comic books. In fact, there's only one other person I know who I would put head to head with you at a at a discussion of comic book lore, history, knowledge, encyclopedia, sort of thing. Um, and someday I'm going to make that happen. Um, but I know uh, I want I want a ticket. <laughs> yeah, right? this will be epic. This will be epic. Um, my, my friend Dan Malman, who we we variously killed in the in the collection, killing Malman. Um, he's a lovely guy, nice little guy, quiet. And I had to figure out a way to kill him in a really gruesome fashion. Anyway, <laughs> um, so comic books influence. I mean, I, I thought I oh, saw yeah. a lot of comic books influencing the scene setting in um, uh, oh, Red Cape. Um, Ven Anyways, Red Cape. Anyways, Red Cape. Yeah. Yes. I, I uh, felt a lot of that there, just in terms of like, not necessarily the character so much, but the description of the scenery and the way that it was sort of, I felt like I was seeing it in panels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was 100% written that way. You know, actually just real quick before I go mm -hmm. on, I, I see that uh, Jack Henry, 
Jack Hanger wrote um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Little Britches, uh, Baby Little Britches reminded him of Baby Huey in, in Looney Tunes, which I was like, oh, uh, Jack's wrong. This is an opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> but, he cor but he corrected himself already. But then he corrected himself. And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> almost, I almost had a chance. I almost we, had a chance there to correct Jack. It didn't happen. We all live for the moment where we can say, "No, Jack, Jack, yeah. you're wrong," and here's why. Yeah, because I, I love cartoons and, and comics and stuff like that, and <laughs> and I would read any comic that passed in front of me, and and it was, uh, you know, I would even uh, tank McNamara in, in the back of the newspaper in the sports pages. I, you know, completely unfunny and uninteresting comic. I would read it. Yeah, read all the editorial pages and and everything. Shut up, Jack. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my my mom, she actually used to read uh, comics to me when I was like four years old, and it was like uh, uh, Fantastic Four mm -hmm. and Thor comics. You know, she really enjoyed doing the uh, um, the dialogue from from Thor, and she really. Liked <laughs> She really liked the thing, um, and I've just I'd always really enjoyed comics, and, and it, it's funny I don't currently it, looking back at my life I, I I consider myself not very well read because no one else around me was reading comics or books or anything like reading wasn't a big deal, um, so I read a lot of things that are off the beaten path, um, you know just, just stuff that's in, in in the same genres, just not what everyone else was reading at the time. Um, and it's kind of the same with comics, like because I would read any kind of comic, there was all those gold, not gold key. Um, oh, Carlton, 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 Carlton Gold Key. No, no. Um, okay. Shoot, it, was, it was a number of his, it, their historical comics, um, and they were based in history. And then there was a number of black history comics mm -hmm. that, that I read, and I, I still have a stack of them. Um, and it, it's just on the tip of my tongue. I can't think of it. Anyway, the point is, when I wrote um, Lightning Wears a Red Cape, I wrote that book like three or four times over the last three decades. You mm -hmm. know, I would write it, put it away, rewrite it in my head, write it again. But it was all born from like, I just I loved all this stuff. But um, there were so many weird holes and strange things in comics that bugged me like um, um why are why do all the women wear bikinis into battle? You know why why does this costume yes. look like that? Because they're gonna play volleyball. Classics <laughs> <laughs> uh, Illustrated. Yeah, Classics Illustrated was one, but um, it wasn't that. Damn it! I'll, it'll come to me. Jack, settle down. Eventually. Anyway, <laughs> the, but the, those questions like that, like if you were a superhero, how would you find crime? You know, they, yeah. they always have this patrol and like, you know, I didn't have a car until I was 30 something. And the amount of times that I stumbled across a crime when I was crossing the city one way or the other, it was like twice. And like one of those was a crime committed against me. And like, how does this work? Like, how does this really work? I, I started just asking a lot more mature questions about it. Um, and that's how I got mixed into lightning. Where's a, a red cape? Like, I was like, well, if people were getting superpowers, you know, what if you're not interested in fighting crime or something like that? Like, wh what would you do and, and how would that affect your life? And then the, the added twist of it all being uh, people of African-American descent or mostly people of African-American descent. And, and what, is, what does that mean uh, mm -hmm. politically and um, how, do, how would people react to it? Um, I also hated the idea of like, you get powers and the the black helicopters come and they're kicking your door in and using mind control and stuff like that. I'm like, this is the same government that can't fix anything else, but they can do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so that's out the window as well. But, but yeah, that's, comics were a huge influence on me. And I absolutely wrote that thinking like, this is the way I would want to write a comic. Mm -hmm. No, I, I hear you because um, I, I talk about uh, when I was started writing the Fangborn novels, I thought of it as if, if I'm going to flip the whole um, werewolf and vampire set of tropes or any any set of them, that they were going to be like the X-Men for me, which was sort of my gateway into comics uh, in, the, in the 80s. Oh. Greg got it. 
it just Great. it just came to me and I looked down and I see that Greg got it. It's Golden Legacy Comics. Golden wow. Legacy. Well <laughs> oh yeah, I should say that we have uh, Greg uh, chiming in with Baby Herman from Who Killed Roger Rabbit. I also want to say a shout out to uh, Clarence Young, who I saw was was tuning in yeah. earlier. Um, but yeah, I wanted to. I, I like the idea of superheroes fighting in secret the vampires and werewolves being the good guys. And they're always on the scene first because they're investigating. They have a compulsion to protect humanity for whatever. Yeah. Uh, there's, so, there's a framework for it that, that makes sense. Like there's something to drive it. Yeah. And one of the principal things I did was when I was in the first story, um, the night things changed, I had Claudia, my, my vampire, um, where she's going into like tackle the bad guy who has, you know, uh, kidnapped a busload full of kids. She ties her hair back and she double lace knots her boots. I'm like, why? You know, we have these flowing tresses. We're gonna go in and fight. It's like that's the stupidest thing in the world. Um, so a little bit of, you know, a little bit of X Men, a little bit of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, a little um, dollop of, uh, oh shoot, Raiders of the Lost Ark in the Fangborn books, just in terms of, of me um, wanting to inject archaeology into everything. But yeah, comics had a, a lot of times you're talking about. Uh, Paul and John about taking something that has an appeal but is kind of broken in a lot of ways and fixing it. And that's how I feel about um, taking some of the tropes that you see in this popular stuff um, and saying, well, okay, let's let's not have a werewolf who's struggling not to be powerful. Let's have a, a werewolf who's a young woman who's never been powerful before. And like, oh yes, and what can I do with this? And she learns <laughs> her voice from it. So. Um, we have a few minutes left. What are you up to next? What is next for you? What's coming out soon? Um, any good news you want to share? Um, yes. Please. <laughs> well, I'm really glad to have that short story in the, uh, the Pixel Projects, uh, Giving the Devil is Due, but I also have a short story in uh, something called The Bad Book that John F.D. Taft edited, and it's a sort of a... Um, yeah, I'm just gonna say it—a perversion of Bible parables. <laughs> oh, I was taking those stories and flipping them on their head. Oh, uh, I have, I a, I have a story in Wicked Creatures from the New England horror writers, mm -hmm. and um, you got a handful. I do. Yeah, it's, it was kind yeah. of surprising they all came at once. Yeah, Even publishing moves so slow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's about it. That, that oh. those are the things that are coming up right away. Very cool. John, do you have anything in the works? Um, yes, and none of it I can talk about yet. So, oh, I cool! Get, I get to be that guy. Tease, tease. <laughs> booking. Then what's? Uh, well, obviously you have flowers for the. See, uh, I'm trying not to say flowers for the sun. <laughs> you know, it's it's just the two are in my head right now. Yeah. Uh, flowers for the sea coming out in October. Yep. And do you have anything in the meantime? I too have secret projects going on. Wow. Yay. So, um, but soon I'll be able to announce. Excellent. Well, we look forward to that. Paul. Uh, trying to get a short story knocked out and then figure out what my next novel will be, um, whether it'll be the sequel of the hour or I've had another idea, um, a fantasy idea stuck in my head a long time. I was wondering, maybe it's time to do that now that I've had the confidence of getting a full novel out. There you go. And, uh, and Mostly super secret, but I do believe there will at least be one more short story for me before the end of the year in an anthology coming out. Yeah, Chris Bolton and, and Jim Moore would yell at you to, to write something different before heading on to that sequel. Okay, so uh, all right, I'll let you yell at me, and I'll say, I'll, I'll tell them. No, Eric yelled at me. It's it. good. <laughs> uh, let's see. I also have a story, um, and it's called "The Kindly Sea." So now we're having more more water and uh, references uh, in um, the Pixel Projects. Giving the Devil is Due. Um, I hope everyone will buy it because it's going to support a fabulous cause. Um, I'm, I'm mostly seeing um, folks uh, not ask so many questions, but sort of um, having a bit of a nerd fight, I should say. Sort of a, <laughs> <laughs> which is completely that's fine. That's our people. That's our people. <laughs> these are, these are, I was going to say, um, that's our audience. Yep. Dana. Yes, dear. I want you to tell us a little bit uh, about Pandora's Orphans, right? So I've read the novels, but I haven't read the short stories. What are the short stories bringing to that universe that's not in the novels or, or you know, what's going on in there? Well, in addition to having a very lovely cover designed by Mr. Eric Nunley, ladies and gentlemen, which I adore. Yay! Yeah, that's a good one. Um, yeah. 
It is a collection of the short stories that I've been publishing since ooh, 2007. And I realized when I started writing um, the first one, I'd never tried writing uh, urban fantasy before of any sort. And it, it sent me into a tizzy because I didn't have any reference books on werewolves and vampires. I mean, and I, I'm an academic, I'm gonna go to my library and I'm like, I have no books, how can this be? And this is after I'd written six novels. So, I mean, it wasn't, you know, like fiction was strange to me. It just wasn't. And finally it came to me and I'm like, I can make this up. <laughs> and it was painful. I mean, the gear is turning in my head. Um, not, not, oh, you know, and then I'm like, and so I'm just gonna go to town. So I started writing these stories set in different, um, part of them were to follow the, uh, the exploits of Jerry and Claudia Steuben, a, a brother and sister, a werewolf and a vampire, and sort of get to know the Fangborn through them. They're local, they, they lived and grew up in Salem, Massachusetts, and I wanted, I like the idea of, of Jerry the vampire having an accent like like I had when I was growing up with the people around me. Growing up. So he's a wicked town. Um, and I, I kind of, I was kind of digging that. The other stories I wrote were historicals set in various periods because A, drawing on archaeology in the past is is what I do, but also it helped me think about how uh, the Fangborn culture might have changed through the years in, in different cultures. Mm. Um, and that's mostly fueled by me going to museums and seeing um, images of, of snakes or dragons and my vampires can take the form of a serpent, a large serpent um, or, or wolves or any sort. And so it was always like, oh, so, uh, my husband gets into this uh, dreadful habit of going, oh, Fangborn, 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 look over there, Fangborn. I'm like, okay, there's lots of <laughs> wolves and snakes, so we just have to calm down because we're going to get kicked out of this museum in a second. <laughs> um, but it's mostly an excuse uh, to write the history of the Fangborn, but also um, because I could mess with history, I was done. So I, my, one of my favorite stories is called the Pax Egyptica. And it's, I decided that uh, I didn't like the way that Cleopatra ended her story. And so I was going to rewrite history. And that's the one time I actually gave myself license to, um, to mess with history. Um, cool. And it, so it's a companion to the books. And the, the novels focus on Zoe Miller, who is a werewolf, a young archaeologist who doesn't know she's a werewolf. And uh, she's to find out about who the Fangborn are because she's grown up outside that culture. Thank you so much for asking, Eric. That was lovely of you. <laughs> But and thank you all for hanging out and chatting tonight. This was a lot of fun, and I'm excited to thank you see stuff and see thank more. You. Oh, my pleasure! And and thanks for everyone for uh, yeah. And I've been enjoying these, Dana. I watched the other ones; they were great. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, and someone should bottle Charlene's laugh. I can't believe it. <laughs> oh. yeah, so she she was. And I gave my room to her at Nikon. I'm so proud of myself. Oh my gosh! Yeah, oh. me and Frank. Me and Frank had. And it, it was she, they put her on the second floor. Oh, yeah. time, so we had to swap for. Her. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but um, my claim to fame. <laughs> there you go. But she is a love, and her laugh is just crazy pants because it comes out of nowhere, and it's it's just it, yeah. it, it's enlivening. Um, but, These have been great. Yeah. Well, thank you, and they will be available on the Facebook page here, so people can swing by and watch them later. They'll also be on my YouTube channel, and um, thanks to everyone who's stopped by. So I will wish you all a good evening, a good weekend, and um, and and good writing. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, y'all. Good night. Good night Take care. Read well. <laughs>